I'm sure you will agree with me that over the past two to three months, life has been drastically disrupted by the effects of the COVID-19. We are now the stay-at-home generation, working remotely from our home office, learning via online courses taken while in our home classroom, home vacationing due to an unwanted and unexpected job termination, and attending church worship services live streamed directly into our home sanctuary. If we do need to leave our home, physical distancing is now a priority. And for some of us, we may desire to wear masks. Our world is living through very different and difficult times. A new normal for now, as COVID-19 continues with its dev devastating effects on job losses, economies, stressing of healthcare systems, and not to mention the tragic growing death toll of human life on this planet. Dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic has become the focus of governments around the world. Truly, times that we will long remember. We are living in those times. People are asking, when will we be able to do the things we now can't do because of the virus? Will we ever re return to normal again? The world is wondering when and how will COVID-19 end? How soon before doctors will find a vaccine? What if none is found? What then? Unanswered questions that we all would like to know the answers of. During this time, I've made two observations. I mean, you probably made your own observations. Here's the two that I've made. The first one is that people will believe what they want to believe regardless of whether true or not. They will believe a conspiracy theory about COVID-19 pandemic, its origin, its cause, and its purpose. They will believe a bogus and untested and even dangerous treatment for COVID-19. What matters more to some people is who spoke the words than if the words spoken are actually truth. The second thing I've noticed, and I think you, you, you've noticed this too, I'm sure you have, the dedication, care, and courage demonstrated by frontline workers who continue to serve even at the risk of becoming infected themselves and in turn infecting their own families. Not to forget that some are under emotional and mental stress as they carry out their jobs. For such people, we should praise God and be thankful for. You know, Dr. Luke tells a story about two disciples walking home to Emmaus, struggling with the truth and their doubts about Jesus, trying to make sense of all the news that happened in Jerusalem, and of a resurrected Savior still demonstrating his love, care, and compassion, of a Jesus who continues to fulfill heaven's mission, serving these two disciples. Follow along in your Bibles as we study the story of the two disciples. It is found in Luke chapter 24. The title of the sermon is Encountering Jesus, The Walk to Remember. Now you and I have an advantage over these two because we know what happens. We know the end of the story on that road to Emmaus. They don't. So it's kind of important because it adds some interest to the story. The, the scripture reading kind of reflected the first part. The scene is set on the same day as the women discovered the empty tomb found in, in verses 1 to 12 of Luke 24. We learn that two disciples are walking, leaving Jerusalem to make their seven mile or 11 kilometer journey to Emmaus. Now this is about a two hour walk, I'm assuming, about a two hour walk. Why are they leaving Jerusalem? Did they fear for their lives now that Jesus has been executed? We don't really know. All that Dr. Luke tells us is that they are grieved about their recent experience. They are talking to one another hoping to make sense of that which is nonsensical. When Jesus himself walks alongside them and joins them on their journey. But Dr. Luke notes this. He says, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Were they so grieved by their experience and so sure that Jesus was gone that they simply didn't expect him? Did Jesus look different after the resurrection, was his face transformed? Was he wearing a mask? 
The resurrected Jesus revealed himself to Mary Magdalene earlier that morning. So why does he not do so to these disciples? I believe, friends, that their eyes were prevented from recognizing him by a divine action. Jesus had a reason for not revealing himself. And here's an irony in this story right now. Two disciples, struggling and searching to know the truth about everything that happened, do not realize that the truth is walking alongside them. Friends, you and I may be struggling to know what is happening to the world, but let us remember that Jesus is still in control. He walks beside us in our darkest experience. He is the friend that Scripture says sticks closer than a brother. The one who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And in 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter reminds us that we should cast all our care upon him, for he cares for you. Let's continue with the story. Verse 17, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened here in these days gone by? Jesus asks them a question. Now, in the King James Version, it reads that Jesus added, as you walk and are sad, at the end of his question. In the NIV and other versions, it says, it reads this way, they stood still and looked downcast. Friends, these disciples were drowning in a sea of sad D words. Disappointment, doubt, disillusionment, despondency, devastation, discouragement, defeat, depression, despair, distraction, and death. All these words sum up how Cleopas and his companion were feeling, looking downcast, disheartened and disoriented from their grief. For them, nothing could ever be normal again. Can you identify with the pain of these disciples, what they just experienced, the death of their dream? COVID-19, as an unwelcome stranger, has interrupted your life and mine. A job loss has thrown you in a financial crisis. The bridge to your future, your ideal future, crumbling underneath your feet, your marriage disintegrating before your very eyes. Have you ever been affected by these D words? Maybe right now you are floundering, trying to keep your head from sinking in your own sea of sad D words. Maybe in the future you may find yourself in that sea. Reach out, friends, and clasp the outstretched hand of Jesus, the unseen stranger walking alongside you, listening to you, and if you are willing to hear his voice, revealing himself to you. When Jesus asked these two disciples what they are discussing, they are incredulous. Who doesn't know what has happened in Jerusalem this past weekend? Where have you been? It was all over the news. It was a trending topic on Twitter. Because this was Passover week, Jewish pilgrims visiting the city from all over the Roman Empire knew about his death. This was not a small, significant event affecting only the disciples. The whole nation was interested. These disciples were surprised at Jesus' ignorance of events. This is the second uh, irony in this story. Cleopas' response to Jesus' question. If anyone understood what happened, it was Jesus. If anyone was clueless, it was the two disciples, clueless Cleopas and his clueless companion. But Jesus continues to question them. And isn't it interesting that Jesus asked them a question? He wants to draw out from them how they feel. He wants to understand from them who they understand Messiah is. Let's continue in verse 19. And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. 
But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. I like it that Jesus allows them to give their story. He wants us to open our hearts to him, sharing with him in prayer, pouring out from our heart the joy and the pain that we may be experiencing. And he listens. Did you catch verse 21? Their dashed hopes are voiced in these words. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Had hoped. We invested our hopes in this Jesus, but he was not whom we had hoped that he would be. Yes, he was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, but as Messiah, he had failed them. Their hopes and their dreams were staked in Jesus as Messiah. He had failed them. At all Jerusalem holds for them now is memories of a might have been Messiah and nothing else. Friends, somewhere in Israel's past, the false messianic preconception of a military Messiah arose. And like a virus, it spread throughout Israel to become the popular belief of the day. The military Messiah was to deliver Israel from her hated enemies, the Romans. Their understanding was clouded by this misconception, and so their own agenda determined their expectations. What clouds our understanding at times? You know, I've wondered why Jesus appears to these two disciples. After all, they're not part of the 12. They're not probably as important. And I wonder why he didn't immediately reveal himself to them. If he had immediately revealed himself, then they would miss the revelation of Messiah from the Old Testament. All we have today is a revelation of Jesus given to us in the scriptures. Why did Jesus appear to these two disciples? I've wondered that. And I believe that Luke 4 verses 18 and 19, hold the answer to this question. You remember the story in Luke 4? It says that Jesus entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, in Nazareth. And he, he read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he was reading from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. His mission statement. Listen to what it said. Luke 4, verses 17 to 19. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Friends, Jesus wanted to minister to those two disciples. Poor and brokenhearted they were because they lacked the true understanding of the gospel. Held captive by a false misconception of the Messiah. Blind to the true understanding of the scriptures about Jesus. And Jesus wanted to proclaim to them what he had accomplished that weekend. And so now it is his turn to talk and they are to listen to his story. Friends, sometimes when we come to God in prayer, we like to talk, but we don't spend time listening. We should, because it is when we listen and we look at his word that God speaks to us. The Holy Spirit opens our minds and our ears to hear something that is important for us to hear. Continuing with the story in Luke 24, verse 25, it says, Then he said to them, Jesus said to them, 
O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Foolish ones. Those words mean this in the Greek. Thick-headed, unwise, unintelligent, sluggish in mind, dull of perception. Their viewpoint lacked a spiritual dimension, leaving them with only a human understanding of events. The word expounded in the Greek contains the root word for hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, we've been talking about that in our Sabbath school lesson this quarter. It, it identifies the methodology of interpreting the biblical text. And in response to these disciples, Jesus begins a Bible study that, dur that extends during the remainder of their walk, interpreting for them the Bible text from the Old Testament of the purposes of God fulfilled through him that weekend. He outlines for them the meaning and significance of his own death. Starting from Moses and the prophets, it was necessary that Jesus would suffer, die, rise, and be lifted up into glory. He clearly distinguished from Scripture the Old Testament, the prophecies of the suffering Messiah, from the prophecies of his glory, and showed how the former had been perfectly fulfilled in all that had happened in recent days in Jerusalem. Doubtless, he referred to the prophecy of Adam and Eve in the garden, of the bruising of the heel of the seed, the command to Abraham to offer up his only son, Isaac, the smitten rock and the upraised serpent in the wilderness, all pointed to him, the sacrifices of the sanctuary services and Christ's predictions of his sufferings in the book of Psalms and in Isaiah. Never had they seen these scriptures so clearly before as to this time as the stranger explained it to them. Luke 24, verse 28, continues with this. They drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them, then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? As they approached their destination, the two disciples noticed that Jesus, he wants to continue on. He wants to keep walking. Friends, Jesus does not force himself upon us. They exhort him to stay with them. They offer hospitality to the one who they believe is a stranger. They offer to be his hosts to this traveling companion and new friend. You know, if they had not invited him in, Jesus would have continued on and they would have not realized it was Jesus all along walking with them. It's interesting that in the Gospel of Luke, there's also an emphasis on meals and the table and eating. You can find it in Luke chapters 5, chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 10 and 11, chapters 14, chapters 19, 22, and in this chapter, 24, we find Jesus at a meal. He is at the table having meals with tax collectors and sinners, with powerful people, Pharisees and lawyers, at Simon's house with guests, and a sinful woman, with Mary and Martha at their home, with Zacchaeus at his home, and at the Last Supper with the apostles. Now again, we find Jesus at the table with these two disciples, and he becomes the host. Verse 30 said this, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Wow. Wow. There's four other occasions in the Bible where these same words also appear. 
reporting that Jesus gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Each one has to do with a meal. Jesus' prayer before the feeding of the 5,000 found in Matthew 14 and in Mark 6, in Luke 9 and in John 6. Jesus did the same thing in the feeding of the 4,000 found in Matthew 15 and in Mark 8. At the Last Supper, found in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22, Jesus does the same thing. Paul repeats this in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. And now after the resurrection, when Jesus was invited to stay and eat with the two disciples here in Luke 24, verse 30. In all cases, Jesus followed the same manner. He took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he distributed it to them. And verse 31 says this, Then their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Wow. The Greek phase for this verse literally means this. Their eyes were completely opened, and they came to fully comprehend him. Jesus opens their eyes. They see everything clearly for the first time. Now they see him as Messiah. They see him as the suffering servant, the Son of God, the resurrected Lord. Friends, do you and I see the same Jesus in our lives? Do we? To his church, to you and I, Jesus says these words in Revelation 3, verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Wow. He, will, he leaves to us this promise that if we invite him into our lives, into our homes, he will come in. He will dine with us and the Holy Spirit will reveal the living Christ to you and I. What a marvelous promise that we have to take hold of. You know what I find ironic? That when those disciples' eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus as he journeyed with them, he was in their sight. They saw him there next to him, next to them. But when their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus, he disappears from their sight. But he leaves them with heartburn. Not the one word heartburn that we need an antacid to relieve, but the two word heartburn, the joy that comes from understanding who Jesus is personally to us in our lives. Luke 24, verse 32, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? When they understood the real meaning of the scriptures, which is about Jesus' death and resurrection, their hearts started burning. The same will happen to you and I. At the beginning of their walk, these two disciples believed that they had lost everything, drowning in a sea of sad D words. But Jesus comes alongside, pulled them out, rescued them, they had not lost everything, he showed them. He had gained everything on their behalf. And now it was time to go and proclaim salvation to all in his name. And they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Verse 33 tells us that. You know, they didn't even eat the food that was blessed by Jesus. Their hearts burned within them that they wanted to go back and tell the disciples and the others that they had been with Jesus. Friends, the Bible is not just a nice ethical code, as important as that may be. It is the history of your redemption and mine through Jesus Christ. It is about the incarnation, the death, the resurrection, and the soon return of Jesus. All these have already been, been fulfilled, yet the second coming remains to be fulfilled. But the fulfillment of his death and resurrection ensures the reliability of the word of God, Jesus pointed them to the word, the scriptures, and the scriptures tell us that he is returning soon. Listen to this quotation from Great Controversy, page 594. It's kind of a reminder, and it's also sad in a way. 
And here's what, what it says. So, speaking of, of, of this story, it says, so in the prophecies of the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented in Scripture. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. It is important, friends, that we don't remain like those two disciples who started that walk to Emmaus with pain and grief. That we don't allow our misunderstanding of Scripture to lose fact that Jesus has promised he's coming back again. A second time, Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and Christ returning soon. Behold, I come quickly, he said. May our hearts burn within us, awaiting for Jesus to return. I want to leave you with this thought, and I pray that, at, that as you review this story, that you will realize the manner and the importance that Jesus conveys to helping us to understand from his word that he is soon coming back. You know, friends, the greatest decision that you and I can make is the decision to follow Jesus, to be ready for him, and to expect his second coming.